After World War II, the US Army started the development of a series of vehicles to replace the ones currently in service. The M4 Sherman was already pretty much on the way out, being replaced by the M46 and the M26 from which it was derived. Those, however, were also pretty much World War II technology and didn't really take advantage of all the developments that had recently occurred. Similarly, the M24 Chafee was developed from the M5 Stuart, which was developed from an earlier tank, and you can see where the lineage has a problem. The three vehicles were going to be the T41, T42, and T43. The T41 was a light. This turned into the M41 Walker Bulldog. T43, after a couple of delays, ended up being the M103 Heavy Tank. T42, however, was lagging a bit behind in development when the Korean War broke out thus giving rise to the Korean tank panic. The US Army was not interested in waiting around for the T-42 to really sort out its troubles, which were mainly with the hull. So they decided that as an expedient, they would take the turret from the T-42 and basically plonk it onto a slightly modified M-46 hull. This would then create the M-47. After a fairly brief testing, it was approved for production and off the orders went to the factory. The T-42 itself continued on with a bit of development. The hull ended up being used as the chassis for the T-69 medium tank, the one with the oscillating turret. We are back at MVTF. You're going to have a look at their M-47 and, yes, you're getting the drill by now. Outside first, hull and turret, and then we hop inside. Let's get started. So off we go. Front hull, 4 inches, sloped at 60 degrees. As you can see, they've removed the rotor cyclone bulge that was on the M46, but they have retained the bow MG. Turret armor is also 4 inches. It is listed at 40 degrees, but as you can see, the turret is angled uh, not just vertically, but also uh, horizontally from frontal impacts. So the effect of armor thickness is actually a little bit thicker. So since we have a good example of the fender markings here, I'll just explain roughly how the armor unit designations work. The triangles represent armored units. A square would be infantry, and there are a couple of other symbols as well which can be used. Usually one bumper will show the vehicle number, platoon, and company, and the other, the higher organization. So in this case, the right fender is showing 3rd Armored Division, 1st Battalion of the 33rd Armored Regiment. The other fender shows Charlie 24, indicating that it is a Charlie Company tank. It is the fourth tank of 2nd Platoon. And by and large, this bumper numbering system actually remains in use today. On the front hull of the tank, not too much behind the bush guards here, we have the various lighting systems, infrared, marker, and service. There is a blackout on the other light mounting. Lifting eyes. Surprise, surprise, to lift the tank. BAUMG already mentioned. Lugs for clevises. Periscopes for the driver and assistant driver's hatches are of a similar design to that found in World War II. They rotate left and right, uh, forwards and backwards for go up and down. And of course, they are also protected by a bush guard of their own. This bush guard also, of course, rotates with the periscope. This bolt up here is part one of the tension process. In order to access the tensioning mechanism, you have to lift up the fender. Well, the fender is hinged, which is simple enough, but in theory, it should also be bolted down. I can only imagine in the field how many times people didn't bother putting the bolt back into place. However, it is technically there. Once you've undone the locking nut, you then take a really large wrench and a couple of lads, Lever the thing up or down to move the idler forwards or backwards, it tensions your track. Lock the locking nut back into place. You can see there are little serrations, little triangular teeth. These are what actually keep the tensioning arm in place. And the locking nut obviously forces the idler adjustment bolt to the, uh, to the arm as necessary. That's actually all there is to tensioning this. It's simply a matter of brute force and time. Fortunately, we've moved on a little bit from then. So things get a little bit intricate for the front suspension here. You'll see that the two leading road wheel arms from number one and number two, they're actually mounted right next to each other. 
Now what they've done is they've reversed the leading arm in order to save space. Now if you think about ordinarily a road wheel arm kind of trails down into the rear and that's the case for almost every tank that you'll see. In this case however uh, what they've done is they've put the hinge at the back and what this has done is it's basically allowed a shorter hull length uh, while still retaining a bit of a slope uh, for the approach angle for the track. Now the catch as you can see is that they have left very little room between the number one road wheel and the idler wheel. So what's going to happen firstly uh, if your road wheel arm is too long and it comes down you're going to have an obstacle like a rock or a bump come along and it will attempt to push this wheel up and back as it encounters it. To save on this, what they've done is they've actually lifted the number one arm so that it's already at an upward angle. When an obstacle comes back, it pushes the wheel up and back out of the way. Still, to make room for this action of the wheel to come up, they have to move the idler wheel forwards. So there are more connections on the back side. So as the wheel comes up, the idler wheel moves with it. This also has the effect of increasing the tension on the track because the actual length of track run between the idler and the number two road wheel would be shorter because there's less of a curve. The number one road wheel has gone out of the way. You can also see other components here. The first, second, last, and second from last road wheel arms also have the shock absorbers. Uh, obviously, as you can see, there's one here for the idler as well. And they also have their volute spring bump stops to stop the arm from swinging too far. The tracks are either T80 E6 steel chevron or T84 E1 rubber chevron. They are 86 per side, 16 inches wide. As you can see, double pin. They have a traditional end connector with a wedge bolt holding it on and the center guides are of this two-prong type. So what we have here is what my cameraman had just referred to as a vestigial tail. This used to be the mounting point for a track tension idler. What this looked like was effectively a return roller on a road wheel arm with a torsion bar spring. And it was designed to apply pressure to the track, pushing it outwards and keeping it tensioned no matter what was happening with the rest of the wheels. Now it turned out that it was completely unnecessary and uh, as you can see they were removed from the vehicle after a while. But you will see it on pictures of some vehicles in the field. You'll also see them on some like for example the American heavy tanks of World War II and a few even lasted out into the M48s. So at the back of the vehicle, items of interest. Obviously you have the rear tail light assembly, have a lifting eye. As you come in, you have the box for the infantry telephone. Partially opens. Obviously, it's been removed from this vehicle. As you move further down, you have access doors. The central access door is used to get the transmission. And these two on either side are brake access doors. Further down, we do have the lugs for towing clevises and the like. And finally, the Pinto for towing things like trailers. And you can argue as to whether or not a tank towing a trailer was a good idea. It was a bit of a fad back in the 1950s to give trailers to tanks simply because they were still running on petrol engines. The fuel economy was terrible. So by adding a trailer, you in theory got a little bit more extra range. The Probably the best one that came out with was the mono trailer for the Centurions, the British one. But uh, a number were tried by the US Army and none were really found acceptable. As we move up to the turret, uh, you can also see, of course, the prominent rangefinder blisters, one on each side, sometimes known as frog's eyes. Coming back, handholds for the tank riders, the infantry. Uh, although in reality, what generally happened was that you just put your, your cargo, your backpacks, duffel bags, and so on, and you tied them to these instead. The purposes of the rain guard completely eludes me. I have no idea why they put it here. I mean, it's a tank, it's designed to be outdoors and wet, and there's probably a reason you don't see them on very many tanks. Storage is not an issue on the vehicle. There's lots of boxes on the sponsons, such as one my feet are on, 
and uh, they are used mainly for the tools, the pioneer kits and the repair tools that are used. For example, you actually have to break track. So now the fun bit. I have swung the turret out of the way, clearing the large bustle so I can access the various louvers and hatches on the engine deck. So we're going to open up uh, the sides of the engine and also underneath me the transmission. Oh, I need my PT, so here we go. I should point out also just how thick these things are. These are not light pieces. You can also see that in addition to the weight, the first one is also screwed in place and all the other ones are open in sequence after it. Now I should say that although the vehicle does look a little bit uh, ratty, she is actually in running condition. So underneath me is the Continental AV1790-5B. It's a 29.4 liter Continental engine, it's a V12, runs on magnetos. Uh, to get at it, you'd lift the oil cooler out of the way. To get at the oil cooler, you have to remove these louvers. Now fortunately, although they are bolted down, and frankly we couldn't go off and find a, uh, a large enough uh, drive to open them up, once the bolts are removed, actually lifting the cooler louvers out of the way are not too much of a problem. It's a two-man lift, yes, but it's something easily done in the field. The open space to the right is where a 13.6 uh, horsepower auxiliary motor will go. Uh, this is for basically running the tank systems when you don't need the power of the main engine and you want to save a bit of fuel or noise, obviously removed from this vehicle. It does have a hand start option, so if you've actually let your batteries drain all the way down, you're saved. The engine being a magneto-driven system doesn't actually need to have the battery generator running either. Uh, once the engine is in motion, magnetos will take care of the rest. Batteries. Four in this vehicle, all of them 12 volts, giving a standard 24-volt system. Two batteries in parallel in series. Engine oil, engine dipstick, not quite next to each other. The oil filler cap is to the rear, the dipstick further forward. Total capacity, 12 gallons. To the rear, the transmission is a CD850-4, as I explained in the M56 video. Cross drive, 850 input horsepower, fourth of the series. Steering is done by uh, control slip differential. Top speed, reasonable 30 miles an hour, reverse 12. Left hand side of the engine, you're going to have the oil filler cap and the dipstick, which goes right next to the bank. You really want to make sure you don't drop anything down here. So the turret monster is well known. The turret monster will eat anything that you happen to need, your pen, map, or what have you. There is an equivalent hull monster, which will take bolts, nuts, tools, and other things. And you can imagine dropping something down here requires removal of the entire pack if you really, really need to get it back. So it is highly recommended you don't, you don't accidentally lose your grip on anything. Then you can reach the dipstick itself. Nice long one. Total capacity, 16 gallons. I'm to say this vehicle is in running order. Also underneath me, you can see one of the two radiator fans. Basically, suck air, blow them out to the rear. Manufactured by Sawyer Bailey of Buffalo, New York. So at the back, we have the cross-drive transmission. Transmission oil comes in here. Another nice long dipstick. This particular one carries 23 gallons of transmission fluid. So that's substantially more than the petrol tank in your car. Transmission itself, nice and compact. This is the section in the middle. On each side, we have the brake mechanisms, which as mentioned, were adjusted by the access panels on the rear of the vehicle. 
Just on the very edge you can see the final drives and that's the final reduction gearing from the transmission to the sprocket wheels. Lastly, the gun travel lock is also on the back deck. As you can see, it's multiple hinges with a very simple screw system to clamp the barrel in place. Probably gets much easier when there's a barrel in it. Well, that's the end of part one. I now have the joy of closing this all up, spinning the turret back to the front and preparing for part two. And that's where I'll see you next time.